Hello, hello. Good time of day, everyone, wherever you are. Um, so today I'm glad to uh, introduce our panel discussion uh, enterprise data challenges in AI era. Uh, AI, of course, is super exciting topic this year. Gen AI is catching all the media attention and attention of so many companies and boards. And uh, here we are to discuss it. And um, let's kick us off with maybe quick introductions. I'm Alexi Utkin, I work at DataArt. I lead our data analytics center of excellence. And um, here we have a panel of experts from different industries. We have Slavak Mai, uh, who is chief uh, technology officer at Cypher Medicine. We have my colleague, Denis Baranov, uh, who has our retail practice. And we have uh, Ilya Wenger, uh, who is um, a data and AI product lead uh, in Microsoft. So, here we are. Hi, everyone. And Hello. Um, Hello. Thank you for taking time. Right. Uh, so let's uh, dive into it. Enterprise data challenges in AI era. Of course, everyone wants to get their hands off uh, on AI and get all the you know value of it and business benefits and change their industries. But of course, as you know and all we know, it is often associated with uh, you know huge challenges and getting data in place, governing data, dealing with data qualities, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of enabling this AI. So today we will be maybe a little bit less discussing AI per se and focusing more on what needs to be in place to, to reap the benefits of, of this powerful technology. And um, I want first to kick it off maybe uh, by Maybe g giving you a little bit uh, uh, to, to share your perspectives of uh, on enterprise data challenges. Maybe just one minute each, uh, some highlights, some some initial thoughts, and then we will dive into a kind of more uh, structured discussion. Yeah, please, in any order if you like. Yeah, happy to start first. And uh, again, Alexei, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so these uh, times everyone talked about like machine learning, advanced technologies, but we could not go here without, let's say, base. And what you have in your data, what is your data quality and what challenges is provide to you, it's also heavily connected with what you will have as a result. And uh, in current world, we probably have interesting challenges which we do not have uh, previously, because right now we have a lot of data which is not accessible. Uh, in early stages, yeah. So, and we also have to not just filter that data, but also try to work: is it right data to use or not? And that seems adding more and more complexity into that level. So, not to get data, but also to work with the data on the right words. And also, it have quite a lot of challenges with: can I use that data? Because it could be personal data, or it's uh, data which not allowed to use or some other things which have to be considered when we talk in enterprise environment, because in, let's say, less regulated companies, we could have some flexibility, but if we are talking about uh, uh, elephants of that world, we have to be really careful which kind of data we use and what would be at the end, because again, we have regulations in place. And for me, all that uh, adds quite a lot of complexity in pretty simple topic, what is our data and how it's managed. Brilliant. Anyone wants to add, Slava, Ilya? Um, I can, I, I can, I can give a little bit of my perspective. Um, you know, and so I'm leading an AI and data product group. Um, and actually, the two things are, you know, as Denise just said, it they're tightly connected. And I would say that, you know, they're connected in both ways. So on one hand, obviously, what data is available that's going to govern the quality of your machine learning and the quality of your AI on one hand. And you also want AI to operate immediately on your data, right? So this is the second thing is about that is, first of all, you need to train your AI and then you need AI to get access to your data. So all the chat to your documents, chat to your data, all these applications or expose uh, your data in the right place at the right time and the right data you know, is a critical uh, element. Um, and on the other hand, and I think that this is where the loop is going back, and I think these are most interesting trends that we're seeing, 
is where we are able to use AI to better govern the data, to better clean the data. And you know, I'm sure that we're going to cover that a little bit later on to synthesize data, um, to make sure that we, um, we use data in order to ensure ethical applications of AI, et cetera. So I think that the, the loop that we've got is self-reinforcing and so living in a very interesting world right now. So very Perfect. happy to be in this talk and have, have sure. everybody. Yeah, well, let me let me say a couple of words uh, from where I am. I've been in life sciences for last twenty some years, and <clears throat> data in life sciences is typically very different than what you see in other industries. <clears throat> we don't get to work with large volumes of data, especially in molecular data, genomics, and genetics. Um, there are certain regulations and laws around privacy and use of data, but also it's very interesting uh, to observe sort of development and, and what happened in, our, in my industry over the last <clears throat> 15 years, because we started using AI and machine learning back in early 2000s and the sample sizes, data sizes were very small. We're talking about 20, 50 patients. Now we're getting to the point where we can analyze uh, data sets of 20 million patients and <clears throat> it's becoming more and more prevalent to look at uh, much larger data sets where use of generative AI, deep learning models is much more suitable than what we had in the past. Um, so I, I think even over the last two years, I see a significant change in development in molecular data, in genomic data, um, that sort of brings hope that we'll be able to use large models just like chat GPT maybe in the near future. Well, that's that's very, very interesting. So it feels like naturally we, we come into some uh, some sort of structure and maybe I can mm -hmm. sum it up like uh, we can first dive a little bit into discussing, you know, sourcing data, get it to, having data in place uh, and then we can uh, spend a little bit of uh, time discussing, you know, how to assess the quality and is it fit for purpose? And then how, you know, how to effectively use it across large organizations and large setups. And then, of course, the topic of governance, ethics and, you know, biases in AI because of the data that I think will be also very interesting discussion. So let, let's kick it off then with, um, you know, sourcing data. And of course the topic is enterprise. So it assumes the large scale, many sources, many people crying for data, many use cases, you know, it may be easy to do something on a scale of, you know, 100 people company. But if you talk about 10,000, 100,000 people company is totally different ball game. So uh, what, what are the things you see in terms of the best practices, interesting developments in terms of sourcing the data, getting, you know, ability to quickly get your hands on the new sources or maybe, I don't know, generate data. So what, what do you see? Now, I think, again, probably one of the trends uh, which I saw quite a lot of uh, around our customers, it first of all, everyone start to be cared about data. I know it's... Uh, sounds a little bit naive but previously large organization could have a massive uh, data around but do not use it at all and uh, they could lose it they do not save it in the right way and still right now some organization figure out they have a massive data somewhere not accessible yeah so and they have to provide like a tools which uh, give them access into that data mostly in real time etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's first large trend and it's also connected or i don't know the next generation of that trend organization start to be data providers yeah so many large organizations right now start to provide data to their competitors to their clients and again it's provide possibilities to get more and more different types of data or probably more let's say rows in your tables which you have not previously and right now again with the clouds no one start to be worried how large massive they save it yeah so i still remember slava mentioned previously and i also had that experience then large organization said we could not save data for two years it's not cheap enough for us yeah so we do not get value from that right now no one worried about that i could go to the aws 
Azure, whatever, any cloud provider and say whatever I want, and it would be cheap for me. And I think it's again, it's another trend. So the people use data, the people save data, and probably we will not lose data anymore in future because everyone will keep it and create a data exchanges, which again, quite trendy in this case. Ilya, Slava, any, any yeah, of um, your perspective? So mm -hmm. I think from our side, it's like the old data governance becomes, you know, comes to the forefront, becomes really important for not just managing your risk, but because, you know, data governance used to be a risk management tool, um, but now it can finally provide some value, some critical business value that is immediate revenue generating uh, for or cost optimization um, uh, tooling that is based on data. So data governance and understanding what kind of data do you have in which lake, where, and the metadata problem becomes by itself a big data problem, right? So because you've got data everywhere, you've got, so you need to manage your data at scale, not just because you need to move petabytes of data, but because you've got 10,000 and 100,000 uh, people organizations who are generating data all the time, some of the data is connected up front, right? But you know, we know that, you know, take any one organization and probably it has 10 or 15 CRM systems, you know, starting from basic Excel to, you know, whatever they, they, they are using. So they've got multiple of these. And this brings to the front sort of beyond uh, understanding what the data is, the whole problem of data harmonization, right? So if you want to make your data useful, you need to harmonize your data. You need to bring it together. You need to understand what it is. You need to bring it to bring it together. And so these, and I think that we're seeing very interesting trends from that perspective in the whole space of metadata management, where it starts to blend with semantic layers and with you know actual data transformation. So you're starting to both understand where the data is. You know, you land it somewhere, you transform it, and it's all being done by the same set of tooling with the modern data stack, et cetera. And um, I think the next wave that we're gonna see, and we're starting to see some snippets of it, is where AI is going to be used to govern and to, and to do all of these things because it becomes a big data problem by itself. So no actual you know, data governance people in the organization, data stewards, et cetera, they can't do all the work by themselves. So they need to have their assistants, their co-pilots or whatever. And I think that this closing the loop is, is really, really critical. Um, so I don't know how it works right now in, in, in healthcare, but it's super interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, a couple of comments on what's happening in healthcare. Uh, data acquisition, traditionally, companies to uh, created their own, would create their own processes such as clinical trials or uh, registries to collect data from patients from particular disease. And as you, as you can imagine, it's a relatively painful process time consuming, very expensive. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can get high quality data, probably on hundreds of patients, not thousands and not, not even millions. Um, that's how it was uh, sort of working back in the day. Now, uh, there are a number of marketplaces or sort of these brokers that offer data, de-identified, commercially available, that is aggregated across multiple organizations, maybe even tens or, or hundreds of organizations in the United States or in Europe, uh, you can acquire that data, whether it's uh, electronic medical records, claims data, other data, even molecular data is becoming more available in those, uh, in, in those marketplaces. That data is um, oftentimes disparate and disjoint. And um, Ilya, you mentioned data harmonization, that it's extremely important in healthcare especially when you look at molecular data such as DNA, RNA, proteomics, other data types that are more um, sort of more sensitive to variability and certain assay conditions, that data needs to be harmonized every time that you obtain data from multiple sources. Uh, sometimes it's even really hard to say what the impact is going to be when you join different data sets coming from uh, different geographic locations, different medical centers. Um, a lot of work is done in uh, developing AI and machine learning tools that allow us to harmonize data, remove batch effects, 
make sure that data is consistent from, um, um, from various sources that we use. And that work has been ongoing for many years and it's still there, right? It doesn't disappear, always happens, same problems every time. Um, once data is acquired and stored in one of the cloud providers, the next question is how can we make that data readily available for analysis? Um, one is, okay, you have data, but you need to get it in shape. You need to digitize well enough, uh, create variables, mathematically speaking, analytical work can be done on certain variables measured over time or different conditions. So you have to create these data frames that can be analyzed by machine learning algorithms. And uh, a lot of effort is still put into understanding what the variables are in healthcare. How can you represent them in, in a way that machine learning algorithms can understand what it is? Um, but I see that a lot of that work can be sort of taken over by AI and uh, tools that can do it very automatically and, and, and quickly. So I, I can sum up like I, I feel that there are two interesting developments, which I can second from my experience working with clients in data. That's the first uh, that the data governance is not, you know, not just the risk thing anymore. And uh, it is largely about reaping the benefits and deriving value of, for, for your use cases. And that it actually happens across the boundaries of the companies so on the kind of industry level. Slava, that's your uh, industry standardization efforts. And I also sense this big hope that Gen AI and all these AI technologies will actually make it possible. It, it kind of a little bit overlaps with data mesh ideas that, you know, governance at a large scale is is not necessarily feasible without the, the good kind of next generation tools and automation and um, things which just enable the scale. Very, very, very interesting. Um, but what about the cases when maybe there is no uh, data yet? It's like oftentimes we have uh, situations when you know you you have a particular use case, you go and try to dive into, you know, what a, you know, do you have data for it in the company? Are there any sources you can consume? And there is nothing, or there is very minimal amount. You just this data wasn't captured. Uh, do you see these situations and what what is done in in such cases? I think it's uh, actually a really interesting question because, for example, in industry, I work quite a lot with retailers. And, you know, everyone in retail and probably in healthcare also talked about supply chain transparency. And all that, like digital programs around supply chain transparency, when we will have whole data about all like movements, et cetera, et cetera, they would be somewhere here in five years, in 10 years. And five years ago, it also was in five years, something like that. So that's like endless journey, unfortunately. And in in this case, then we start to do like a data analysis when we try to apply some additional algorithm. Actually, what mentioned like a machine learning tools or some artificial intelligence tools could help us to fill that gaps. Again, to do close to reality predictions uh, because that usually data usually fractural. We could have like a part of data here, part of data there, but we could have some gaps between that because that part of supply chain not digital enough, or I don't know, we lost some data because of transparent or something, other things happens. So uh, I saw trends, for example, companies who are working on that area, they start to use that algorithm to fill that gaps and to provide that picture, which probably not 100% uh, close to the reality, but sometimes 95% or 90%, it's more than enough. It, previously, it was 20. And again, I, I think it's quite trendy in other industries. So, and what Ilya mentioned, like then we start to use that tooling to add that information which missed or which not available for us. And again, some data could be generated. And also when we do that exercise, we probably could calculate another like a risk to have that inconsistent or unpredictable data. And if, if we could reduce that risks for the business based on that, again, aggregation, sometimes it could be good enough. Yeah, so that's based on my experience. Slava, probably you could mention because I could guess you have quite a lot of your industry as well. Yeah, I mean, we always deal with uh lack or scarcity of certain data sets. 
whether it's a new project or a new disease area, the first question is, do we have data? Let's imagine we're building a predictive model. We're trying to use some of the molecular features and predict certain clinical outcome. Um, typically, what you need is a training set, development set, where you where you have very rigorously collected data set with specific labels of outcome, yes or no. Um, and oftentimes, this is where the challenge is, is that you can have uh, probably access to relatively large data sets of uh, image data or molecular data that may not have collected clinical outcomes data. And this is, I think, where we are going to see uh, some of the disruption that is happening by using generative models where you can attempt to annotate data that may have missing information with the right labels by using generative AI and enhance your data sets with potentially thousands and thousands of patients that um, we might not, not have access to that before, right? And to me, it seems that um, it can give us this advantage or whoever is gonna be using those algorithms will get the advantage of using larger data sets with, we used to call it imputation, right? Well, the way that we impute now may be different, but statistically speaking, imputed data that can populate much larger data sets that can be used for training and development and then lead to a much higher success rate in developing predictive models. Yeah. I think this is super interesting. And I think, you know, in, in, in healthcare, obviously real world evidence becomes, you know, much more prominent, I think, you know, in the last whatever decade, probably. Um, so, and, and I'm looking forward <laughs> to a lot of developments in that area. Um, you know, my background is, is, is very scientific, um, sort of originally in metabolomics and, and biology as well. And actually, you know, these days, a lot of these areas have in silico experiments, which essentially generate eventually, you know, the combinations of potential outcomes that are realistic. Um, and so, and so you can, you can derive constraints from other data points and then transfer them into, into real world, uh, into your real world and essentially generate excel in silico experiments, which is super interesting, sort of one area you know, on the science side. And I think that you know, generative AI can generate data, right? We know that. I think there's very interesting questions around when this synthetic data is being generated and if it is being fed back into AI, which kinds of artifacts or aberrations are we generating? Um, and and there's 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 actually very significant breakthroughs in that space as well. Because on one hand, it's you know it's a photocopier, right? So you you know I've got a photocopy on a photocopy on a photocopy, and I've got some artifacts from the system, and these augment each other. However, if you do put um, filtering on top, if you do put curation on top, if you do um, you know, and, and this curation can be through human signal, but also not only for human signal, but um, but through curation through AI systems as well, which we're seeing more and more. And so, you know, there's, I think that what this time last year, I think as um, GPT 3.5 came out, chat GPT, right? Everybody said, okay, we're running out of data, right? Um, you will hear that these noises have subsided since, um, and partially because, well, A, you know, even ChatGPT, when somebody's talking to it, you can, you can infer what data is useful, what data is not useful that is being generated by the machine. So you actually can increase through the usage, you can increase a lot the, the amount of available data. It's much less specific, I think, than, um, than the data and, and definitely still augments certain artifacts. But I think this is a very interesting area. And then the other area where also a little bit like real world evidence in, 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 in medicine, what you get is uh, mining of data that you did not think that was useful for, for something, right? So I can mine my customer support calls that I could not do earlier. Now I can 
uh, mine them and instead of getting a fixed ticket that was registered in my incident management system, I can understand what incidents does my system actually face from the raw transcripts. And right now it's become very cheap to process them, right? And it used to be significantly more expensive, I don't know, two or three years ago, you know, even. Um, so I think that mining of data on one hand and on, on the other hand, generating, generating novel data and curating it, these are two elements that are going to significantly increase the amount of available data. So again, very exciting. I, 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 want to, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I just want to add probably interesting into that because I really like your idea around like photocopy and artifacts which happened and i heard quite a lot of rumors about what we will have a, a, as generated data but i think we should not forget then uh, people working with data they also create the years and we also have some artifacts because of our backgrounds is it like uh, what is our education etc etc so i i'm not so worried about that yeah i worried we will have better data than previously and find something human years but not artificial intelligence artifacts in our data so so then on this one is is then you know gen ai with data generation and you know synthetic data you know being fed into the systems etc is it more a threat to the you know data quality data trustworthiness or or is it more the opportunity to, to you know, Ilya, maybe in similar way to your story, uh, you know, use Gene AI to actually finally get the better, you know, efforts, rewards, balance in trying to reach to the high high data quality? What, what do you think? Is it more opportunity or a threat? Each opportunity is a threat. Yeah. So because <laughs> uh, it's it's based how you use it, and again. Uh, you know, I remember stories, and sorry to mention not data world, but blockchain. And uh, blockchain also have a quite a lot of rumors. Is it for good, for bad, how we use it? And again, right now, we could see again how is the technology uh, distributed ledger it's approaching us and how we could work with that or not the same actually with the data generation again i think unfortunately still we will face quite a lot of challenges of trust because again i remember we, we talked about chat gpt and i remember then the first year start appearing questions to chat gpt everyone said oh i know it's never worked yeah so it's just all fake and it's answer to the question the way it should not answer. I think the same we will uh, face here in like a generated data. And that's again, the topic which we mentioned like a data quality or how we do like additional quality checks. It start to be important because we could have quite a lot of data which could be artificial. But I think it's also provide us a lot of opportunities. Again, in the cases then we miss that, or then we spend like ages of the people to work with the data to make it better, to aggregate it or somehow. Right now we could do it easily and experiment the same. The same as again, other technologies come to us like EIT and others provide us new possibilities to think about things which we do not do previously. Yes, so, and I think again it's open up. I don't know, new age, how we could use data because of that. So th then yeah. it's of course, even on the retail side of, uh, you know, industry focus, uh, you, you must be very adventurous. And mm -hmm. I reckon Slava may have a little bit more conservative perspective. On I, I mean, on the, the, right. The good thing about life sciences and especially drug development industry diagnostics is that uh, we have a very rigorous process of validating our products. And uh, from my perspective, it almost doesn't matter what data you use and how you generate data, how you populate your databases to create products, as long as the, those products work. And the way that we test it is through very well organized and controlled clinical trials uh, where it's tested on real patients. And if the product, whether it's, let's say you use some simulated or generated data to develop a new drug or a compound and then you see in phase one phase two phase three clinical trials that it works great that only helps and if it if it makes us do it faster and more risk averse with more productivity the better it is same in diagnostics if we use 
a generated data set to create a predictive algorithm that allows us to diagnose a difficult condition or uh, build a predictive test to identify or understand treatment response before putting patients on therapy and it works through clinical trials and clinical evidence, then it's great. Yeah. It, it's it's just, just that simple. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Can we maybe shift uh, gears a little bit? And um, okay, so we, we discussed, you know, getting data, ensuring its quality, maybe generating some data. So let's assume it's in place and, and uh, discuss a little bit, uh, you know, using the data and collaborating around data. And I, I keep having this um, analogy in my head of, you know, I think throughout the last five, 10, 15 years, a lot of uh, enterprise systems and general software systems were broken down from monoliths to smaller parts and integrated through APIs. And basically now everything you do, like you go into a store, you pay with your card and here you are like 15 different companies get bits of this data and they're kind of involved in, you know, processing your payments or I don't know, the, uh, stock management systems uh, get transactions and so on. So a lot of parties involved and, uh, you know, 10 years ago, everyone was discussing data silos within the company, but now, you know, a lot of data silos are actually happening across the companies, but they are, you know, effectively just part of the same, you know, bigger picture. So um, with that, I kind of want to come to a question. Do, do you see interesting breakthroughs or developments in this ability to actually use data and collaborate on developing analytical use cases or consuming data or just working together, joining different bits of data? across the companies on a wider scale, uh, not trying to bring it all into your company just and sit on this. Anything interesting there? So I think Slava, you mentioned earlier, sorry, Dennis, but you mentioned earlier about sort of data exchanges for molecular data, for example, et cetera. So I think that, you know, these are the, this is the breaking of those silos. It would be very interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah, it, it, in a way it is. Um, some companies that may be not interested in, for example, developing therapeutics, but do have access to healthcare data. Perhaps it's the payers or provider organizations that have access to electronic medical records. Um, they are willing to commercially share their data sets with uh, de-identified information um, with the idea to help in, uh, in research and development for pharmaceutical companies or other companies that do product development in the industry. Um, there are a number of examples where sort of these um, consortia have been formed to do pre-competitive data collaborations where maybe it's in com combination with academic institutions where typically where data is generated. Um, some pharmaceutical companies, drug development companies would come into a joint collaboration to develop large data sets that can be mined all of the uh, organizational members for their own benefit, right? That usually happens pre-competitively, pre-filing uh, pre any sort of IP positions. Um, there are a lot of examples like that, but typically once you begin to get into the stage of product development or preclinical trials, then it becomes very, very um, heavily siloed within the organization because it's all about intellectual property. It's all about know-how and the competitive advantage. Interesting. Any other perspective? Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty the same, honestly, in the retail industry yeah? so, or in finance industry, which I work sometimes as well. Again, I, I saw more and more collaboration previously around data exchanges. And again, the company is happy to share it some data, again, probably not for free or for some collaboration frameworks. Again, for example, some brands could get data from marketplaces, etc., etc., because they're interested into that. But then we are talking about some, let's say, top-notch technology like a prediction algorithm, prediction sales, or how we create new products. It's tight to be silent because, again, it's like a competitive advantages and 
everyone knows all your competitors are doing that, but how exactly? It's not easy to get. Uh, but again, probably when we go to more and more to the marketplace ages and the pre-trained models will be another type of things which we could sell. Again, I, I think we will see how that could be open up new markets and some companies probably will be happy to share it. They pre-trained models again because it's changed quite a lot in that part of the, let's say, process. But at the same time, I could guess the latest ones still would be in house and asylum somewhere under the cupboard. Well, you know what, what, what I see is um, a part of the data exchanges per se, you see, at least in finance or like in fintech especially, and more and more uh, companies see their development of data and analytical products, being it like data portals or platforms, as a competitive advantage for the core pro software, say, or API product. So say if you're choosing a payment processor and there is one which will just process your payments or another one which will happily give you the data about your payments and enrich in something and give you, I don't know, ability to slice and dice and uh, insights out of it, then you will have a strong reason to choose the second one. And, and it also can be a source of much deeper business partnership rather than, you know, just, you know, exchanging money and, uh, the, the, the core service on its own. Interesting. Um, I, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very it's something that I've been I've been actually exploring for for quite a bit, and I think sort of one interesting element about this is that, and and we talked here about two things, right? It's like so on one hand you've got the incentives, right? So you need to drive the incentives as a data producer. You've got multiple different incentives. You can sell the data directly, you can sell the data, or you can strengthen your core product. Alex is just you know, right now you told us that yes, as a as a payment processor, if I'm also selling insights about the payment, you know, this is a huge value add and makes you significantly more sticky because I insert myself into the business processes of my of my customers, and then you know they can't just swap me out. Um, so these are sort of there's strong incentives on the business side. Um, a lot of them actually are driven by the fact that it's much easier these days. To push data, to push data to your customers and to interchange. Um, there are incentives on the buyer side, of course, because you know I want to make my business smarter. I want to spend less time on my clinical trial, or 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 you know have a better prediction up front. Um, and then this is where it meets the technologists, right? And then the technologists actually, and the and the technologists, it's always okay. So we need to facilitate that exchange. So you've got some technologists that are playing the game of okay, we're going to become the data marketplace, or we're going to provide um, a place where big players like, you know, big financial services firms like the Bloombergs of this world or Moody's or, or else Infinitive, you know, so where in financial services, they would be bringing their data, um, or we're playing the role of a sort of harmonization platform, right? So everybody's now offering, you know, a fire a fire data movement service, right? It's like, okay, if I want to move my data from electronic medical records, I want to harmonize that, my technology provider will be providing the smoothest trails possible to move to move the data from one place to another place. Um, so I think that these trends are sort of coming together. And again, uh, we're going to see more and more of that. With AI, the super interesting, and Dennis sort of referring to what you said, a super interesting trend that we're going to be seeing. So, a um, and especially with the recent announcements from from OpenAI around sort of marketplaces for GPTs, marketplaces for for models, etc. It's not just the models; it's the models, it's the potentially the, the the fragmentation of fine tuning layers that I would be able to just offer a specific fine tuning layer, and I could um, could offer my you know. Could could swap in and swap out my my lawyers, etc. So I think there's very interesting technological as well as business trends that are combining here in uh, bringing making that data exchange significantly more effective than it used to be. Wonderful, no, very very, very interesting perspective. Right, um, uh, just keeping track of time. I think we all in the beginning said that um, you know AI. Era brings us very interesting challenges in the space of data governance, AI governance, model governance, 
ed ethics bias and so on. So let's give this a little bit of color. So um, shall we dive into maybe the data governance first and then go to AI governance? So uh, in what way do you think approaches to data governance change with this bigger demand on AI and also AI technologies um, come into the market? Uh, you know, uh, Ilya, you mentioned in the beginning that it, it is largely about moving from controlling the risk to, you know, enabling the opportunity. So um, what's, what's perspective, what developments get you excited in this data governance area associated with AI? I think one, one thing that, that I mentioned in the beginning is I think the automation and the activization of data governance, I think that this is one thing that, you know, everybody hates doing it, right? That's like, I don't know one person that actually loves doing data governance, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's a very meta place, right? You're either setting up, you know, you're either managing the metadata by yourself, i.e. not managing actually the data, or you're setting up processes for the management of metadata. So this is a second derivative of, um, of, of metadata management. And so, you know, nobody really wants to do that. So the more we are able to offload that work um, uh, to AI and to machines, you know, I think this is very exciting because, you know, it's going to remove work that we don't like to do um and and do it much better hopefully and you know i think we're going to be seeing very interesting things coming up very soon in that space but does it include the the coverage of the recent uh, you know regulatory additions like the you know gdpr can you use this data for this purpose the other purpose you need to declare all your you know use cases uh, etc like do you think that this part of data governance as well will be uh, somehow uh, helped with the uh, Use of yeah, AI. I think isn't that just a lineage? Well, a, a lineage problem essentially, right? So it's a lineage of okay, where does my data come from? What does it represent? And where does it go, right? Into what application? And how am I using that in my in my downstream? So eventually, it it comes boils down to the same problem. Um, so yeah, I guess. Yeah. Then yeah. Slava, any perspective? Yeah, from I mean, we in life sciences, we are highly regulated. Uh, we have HIPAA, we have all kinds of regulations and laws around data privacy and uh, data security. Um, we have to follow all of them. We're very careful about data de-identification and use of um, any type of uh, genomic genetic data in research. We have to consent every participant for and ask them for release of their data to use in, in any R&D activities. Um, so I think not a lot is changing for us, though GDPR has been a little bit more cumbersome to work with, uh, but but it sort of requires more consenting and, and getting more buy-in from, from the patient, from participant in the study to release their information for research. Um, and it's interesting to me <laughs> to kind of compare what's happening in other industries in retail, for example, in, in fintech and others, uh, obviously in big tech, uh, where uh, some of the apps can literally scrape all of my data from my phone without even asking me about anything. Um, and, and here we are in life sciences, we have to fill out all the, this paperwork of so many pages that patients have to agree to release some of their basic demographic information for us to use in, in research. Um, yeah, I, I, I think in general, um, the cost and the risk of data breach or um, some sort of data leak in life sciences is a lot higher than maybe in other industries. Even though we may not be dealing with uh, billions of data points, maybe we're dealing with hundreds of patients in the trial, but um, the regulations are just very strict. I think if you are talking about retail, I probably argue a little bit uh, with Slava. It's also regulated, yes. Uh, and uh, application could not scratch everything without your consent. And again, all things like a GDPR, etc., regulated, it's pretty heavily. And again, in current ages, it start to add in more and more challenges. Again, because for example, uh, people start to understood 
the data could be scrapped from the phone and from, I don't know, Facebook, from any other networks. And we see quite a lot of developments around them when people come in and say, how you get my data, how you use it, etc. And retailers who are used quite a lot of data, they buy data, they buy advertising, they use different like a providers have to answer to that question and uh, if you go deeply into that uh, as soon as we use the data for train for example i don't know any model large model or small model or whatever yeah so after that we could be in a trap then someone came to us and say you have to delete all my data which you use does it mean i have to delete that model does it mean that the right to be forgotten is executed in right way or not. Because I remember, again, I mentioned blockchain and we worked with blockchain some kind of the project. And the first question after we go to the production, it was, could we delete data? Yeah, so immediately, like a week after that we was in production, but you could not delete data in blockchain. I think the same you, you start see in like a artificial intelligence. And I know it's quite a lot of challenges because, yeah, I talked with your colleagues from Microsoft again around that. And many companies right now worked in committees together with government to make it more regulated because, again, then GDPR was created, chat GPT was not here. Yeah, so, and that quite a lot of challenges how that two things could live together. I, I would, this is actually a super interesting point because this opens new challenges, right? So AI opens completely new challenges. You're saying that, yes, data gets embedded in a new way within a model that we did not have before, right? So, you know, before the data, you know, we maybe had it in, in blockchain. So this is uh, actually a very good example um, and something that we can actually leverage and learn from, I hope. Um, and then the other bit is that the legal um, stages around data are not sufficient, right? We are seeing legal challenges on the usage of copyrighted data, um, you know, and then you've got the real question, you know, it's like, is this a breach of copyright or is this not a breach of copyright, right? And the le current legal frameworks are just not sufficient. And we're going to be seeing more and more of that, you know, we don't yet see we don't yet know how exactly it's going to be impacting us, but I think that this is something something to watch. I, I wonder if GPT-5 will be writing the next uh, regulatory framework for AI and data governance uh, to, to address these uh, challenges. Uh, but Ilya, you mentioned, um, and, and Dennis really said as well, that you know, this AI and the more extended use of advanced analytics and, and AI models themselves present new challenges to, to governance, right? They, you know, it's not about only governing the data which goes in, it's also the state of your models and can this data be used for these models and and even you know coming to the ethical questions you know can certain like is it ethical to apply certain models for certain things for certain use cases so what's the what's the cutting edge there what what do you see people are trying to do to you know this is very new area but to to start uh, you know putting it right uh, Slava, actually, I would, I, I would love, you know, I can give my perspective. You know, I think we're dealing with this day in, day out. You know, yesterday night and and tonight, I'm still going to be in in committees actually dealing exactly with these things. But uh, I'm actually interested to hear, you know, healthcare has been at this game significantly longer. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, that's very true. Um, especially in the diagnostic industry, I've been in that space for more than more than a decade, and. Um, uh, oftentimes, you get a biological sample from a patient, and then you may run a panel of biomarkers on that sample. Um, and because sometimes it's less or more economical to run a larger panel of biomarkers, you get more information than was requested by the physician. And um, it's always you have to be so careful about how those uh, results are looked at and whether you can interpret the results and whether there's a um, certain point in your pathway where someone gets access to a result that was not requested by the patient and physician and would that result lead to potentially critical information for example I, i'm just going to be very simplistic uh detection of cancer right someone didn't ask for it 
but you accident you have an accidental finding and some a doctor or pathologist or someone on the team in the diagnostic laboratory looked at that result and they saw it then mm. ethically you are um you have to that, report that result to the patient. So there are many ways that diagnostic companies try to um, create specific structures around the sort of data analytical pipelines that extra results are not even considered or interpreted so that they're not stuck in that ethical dilemma whether that predictive um, data point needs to be reported back. Wow, that's a very interesting perspective. Um, interesting. This is, you know, in, in our world, the problems are, are, are quite different. Um, and I would split really the way that we are developing um, AI, you know, into two risks, right? Or two, two ethical, big ethical considerations. And they're very related, right? It's like people love to draw the dichotomy between societal risks and let's call them greater existential risks and you know people are saying okay it's either this or that and you're treating either either this risk or that risk um and i can say that you know the 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 general societal risks this is something that even before the really stronger ai models that we currently have you know this has been always on our plate um you know it's like and and this needs to be needs to be controlled and you know every machine learning model that is coming out into the wild is being reviewed for potential biases potential harms um you know with with a good classification of of each one with a sort of strong review and governance mechanisms so you know these are these are just staples but i think below everything right and below and in order for us to deal with the with the real ethical and and risk considerations or risk for people um considerations i think there's two things ultimately one is that um we need to make sure that that we understand how the ai works and we're not great at this right but generally speaking interpretability you know, this is one thing that we are continuously looking for, right? And wherever we, and, and we know that, you know, if we've got an unknown unknown, we need to treat it even more carefully, right? Um, so you need to identify where you don't actually have interpretability. I think there's been quite a lot of progress in, and, and I hope there will be more because it's not enough yet uh, in model interpretability. Um, but still, you know, so you need to to have your eyes on the target. And the second thing is control, right? Is and control is is several different things, right? Control is on one hand being a knowing where you are deploying your models, knowing what harms may come out of them. So all those old um, old elements they must be in place for for anything that that we're developing. Um, so I think that. You know, and eventually understanding these two things are are key to manage our overall risk posture, if if I were to say. Yeah, I couldn't agree yeah. actually more because uh, what what you mentioned here about ethics problems, it's also like then a person answering to your question, the person have some again ethical background in his mind, in his or her mind, of course. But uh, then we are trained model, we do not think about that, and accessibility of the model really important because uh, someone who have access to the model answer or ask some question, get some data. And after that, just treat it as a reality. Yeah, it is a truth mm. because they believe it is true. Yeah, and again, in this case, the issues and challenges which you just mentioned, it's like a quadruple because again, what if some I don't know school boy or girl came to the GPT model and ask some question and get not right answer? Yeah, how he? Of course, I just help analyze that. But again, it's the same as Slava mentioned. Is we get the data? Is it true or not? Should we treat it as a like a truth should we use it and uh, that many things which behind that the model and probably person if you ask that question do not answer to that model will answer and that that's a little bit scary into that Dennis, I, I must tell you that uh, children coming to chat gpt and getting wrong answers is not a risk it is a reality it happens every day at large, large scale Right. Uh, being conscious of time, maybe um, kind of wrap up question and perspective. Uh, still, still around ethics and, and bias. Um, 
And I, I say just a quick, I, I have to bow sure. out. Unfortunately, I have a hard stop at uh, one o'clock my time, but I really enjoyed oh, the panel. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for being with us and sharing your perspective, Slava. Nice to meet you. you. Thank nice to meet you. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, um, Daniel Slava just then wrapping up a uh, question on points on, on bias. Um, so, um, ethics, like, you know, people are actually taught ethics to a large degree, like whether something is ethical or not. And, and still in analytics and AI, it often comes down to, you know, just not feeding the data, which, you know, somehow associated with ethics, like your gender or, uh, race or things like that. So do, do you think that uh, to address ethical challenges uh, for, you know, for models and AI to be, you know, in line with the, what society wants it to be, we actually need to be explicitly teaching AI to be ethical rather than just not, you know, not feeding the right data. And an associated question with it is, if we are, if we will be teaching them ethics, then who, who, like, who should actually do it? Is it the data scientist's job, or is it, you know, a larger sort of data and AI governance framework job, or who, who is in charge? So, what do you think? This is a very loaded question, um, you know, and and I don't think there's the right answer, right? I, I don't think anybody knows yet, and we we're discovering this, um, and I think. Again, making a lot of progress on this. Um, so, so let me split it into two, right? So one is data. Um, and by, by the way, bias in data is not a, is not a simple thing. You know, it's, it's, you know, our world is naturally um, inclined. You know, we've got, we've got some natural biases that we don't want to perpetrate. Right. So the usual question is, if I'm giving an image generation model um, a prompt and I ask to generate a picture of a doctor, then it is more likely to generate a male doctor. Right now, it's because there are more males in uh, um, in pictures about doctors, etc. cetera. Um, and then uh, the second bit is that on the other hand, there are more male doctors than female doctors. So probabilistically, you've got I don't know, about 63% uh, 63 male um, physicians versus 37% um, uh, percent females. So, you know, is that the reality that we want to represent, right? So we are not happy with the reality of the data as it currently is. And so we want to change it, right? And on the other hand, there are real biases, you know, other biases in the data where we definitely know that there are mistruths. Um, and so we need to treat both of these biases in a certain way. And this is on the input side. And then on the output side is, um, okay, how do we control, how do we control the outputs? And, you know, Alexei, I loved your questions. Like who's deciding whom are, you know, who's gonna be controlling the data, right? And we've seen these, you know, two things or who's going to be controlling the outputs of AI, right? We've seen two examples, right? One example is in how OpenAI have trained their data. When they were training their data, there is a questionnaire that um, when you're providing uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, there's a questionnaire that allows you to check, um, you know, that checks whether you're suitable because if you are exhibiting extremist views, we don't want you to be in the pool of people who are contributing. Um, yeah. So there's some bias in that selection and some decision in that selection. And on the other hand, you know, you've got very interesting points where AI is able to control the outputs, right? Constitutional AI, where you've got, let's say, the 17 commandments of Anthropic um, that have decided, okay, these are the things that, you know, a model should not be offending anyone, right? If, and if it does, you need to rephrase the answer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, who's decided that that these are the right 17 commandments. Um, so I think these are very interesting questions. I don't think we've got all the answers yet, but at least we've got approaches there, which is super critical. And it's critical that people are thinking about that. And I think this is yeah. the most important thing. 
Also, I, I think humanity yeah. spent like, uh, what is, 22 centuries to go to that point, yeah. And of course, artificial intelligence could do it uh, easier, and if we probably spend quite a lot of computer power to some model go for that 22 centuries, in this case, it would be the same ethical as us, so completely different, we don't know. But without that, we still will have some local maximum or something hmm. like that and transfer which we don't really like for. Again, because the model will just get all information which we put into it. And we could retrain it, we could change it, but after that we have another model which also have some uh, not good enough transfers for us. Yeah. So again, if you start treating that as uh, some intelligence, artificial, but still intelligence, we probably should admit it will have some the same challenges as humanity have right now. Yeah, so some answers from different parts of humanity could be different. Yeah, but here we probably go into really, really interesting conversation, which never end if you go deeply into that. For which we wouldn't have time because I must wrap up our session about here. Uh, but I'm glad that we, you know, such uh, brilliant people thinking about it. I, I, I have ground to hope for the better future of AI and uh, solving some of the ethical challenges. I'd like to thank uh, our watchers for being with us and uh, welcome you to join uh, other IT non-stop sessions, uh, panel discussions and lectures. And don't miss your chance for the brighter future with uh, AI being around us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you, Alexei, to be a great host. And thank you, everyone, thanks. for watching us.